All right, let's go, Lord. Lord, we just praise you and thank you. We ask forgiveness, first of all, Lord. You might hear and answer our prayers, Lord God, and there wouldn't be any hindrance to them. And Lord, you've heard these, Lord. These are those that we have praises and those that are needing a touch from you physically, Lord. There are those that need a touch from you, Lord, that have lost loved ones, that are suffering, Lord. There are unspokens, God. Uh, there are physical problems, Lord. There's emotional, spiritual problems all the way around, God. We just ask that you have mercy. Lord, we thank you for your word, Lord. I pray that you would... Uh, uh, consecrate this time, Lord, and, and, and help me to deliver this uh, this message, Lord, that's pleasing unto you. And, Lord, I pray you remove any nervousness or un awkwardness or uncomfortableness, Lord. We want to hear from you and your word. You speak to everything, God. There's not a question that is not answered in your word. And we just pray, God, that you'd receive glory in that and you'd touch our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right. Amen. And so uh, we're gonna we're gonna start. And I don't know how long it'll be that we'll stay on this subject. I know it'll be at least two weeks. Uh, I am. I told y'all that we were gonna have a question. Uh, anybody that's got questions, and we'll we may do that towards the end or whatever. And uh, but if, 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 if we may do it at the end, I don't know if if there's a question that hasn't been answered. We'll we'll we'll. See, I, I'm, I'm hopefully I'm going to cover up enough ground to get most of that stuff done. And so, the first thing is, who is the God of sex? That's the question. Everybody got a hand out? Anybody need a hand out? Who is the God of sex? God. Who? Sorry. God. Yeah. Yahweh. <clears throat> Yahweh. Let me do like this. Uh, the God of Israel, Yahweh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God that created the universe. Our God is the God of sex. And we need to understand that. Somebody read Genesis 2, 24 there. Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. Now most people don't understand what that means, because that has dual meaning. But when a man goes into his wife, they become one flesh. That is how a marriage is consummated. That is how a covenant is confirmed. And that has a, both a physical application and it has a spiritual application. Somebody read Genesis 2, I mean 1, Then God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and <clears throat> subdue it. Have dominion over the fish in the sea, over the birds of the air, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. So, the first... In the first scripture, what is the command for husband and wives to do? Be fruitful and multiply. Now, the first one. Yeah. What does that mean? Have sex. That's what that means. Now, does that blow your mind? That God, the very first thing, when God commanded Mary, He's commanding you to be joined together physically. And then what is something you said the second one? One, one is to multiply. have babies. Right? What's it? What do you gotta do to have babies? You gotta come together. And so so do you do we do we gotta get our mind wrapped around that this part of the marriage relationship is foundational. It is pivotal. It is pivotal. It is what it's about. It's what it's about. Yeah. Why does it say husband know your wife or right? It says it like that. Anytime you say, see no, it is sex. Anytime in your Bible when you say so and so knew so and so, it is about physical sex. And so uh, some translations, uh, if, you're, if you're in the King James, I might, I maybe even the New King James uses the word no, but you need to know that, that no means physical, physical relation. So we need to understand that our God is the God of sex. He created it. He likes it. He wants it. He wants you to do it. But he wants you to do it his way. He wants you to do it his way. So, so if we know God is the God of sex and he wants us to have sex, then we need to understand what is biblical sex. 
because this is this is where uh, we get all mixed up. Now I gave you the answer to this question. Somebody said you like the answers. Somebody read that in italics right there. Any intimate contact, physical, emotional, or spiritual of a sexual nature that is not forbidden by scripture, that brings intimacy and pleasure to both husband and wife and causes no physical, emotional, or spiritual harm. Now, there's some qualifiers in that statement, isn't there? And we're gonna talk about that next week whenever we talk about what goes on in the bedroom. And, and but, but the, the thing to remember is this, <clears throat> the key is that, first of all, it is of a sexual nature. Anything you're doing of a sexual nature and that brings intimacy and pleasure. Those gotta be hooked together, okay? Intimacy and pleasure. And here is the big qualifier to both the husband and the wife. And we'll, fit, we'll flesh that what out that means uh, uh, later on, but that is what biblical sex is. And it is always, always, always between a husband and a wife. It is never, ever, ever between two individuals that are married in covenant before God. There is no exceptions to that. It don't matter if you love each other. It don't matter if you're engaged to be married. It is always into this context right here. It is always between husband and wife. Now let's look at the consequences number three. How did the consequences of the fall affect the sexual relationship? Whenever, whenever Eve sinned and Adam joined her in her sin, what did that do to this? Somebody read Genesis 3.10. He answered, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, who told you that you are naked? Have you, have you eaten from the trees I commanded you not to eat from? Okay, so think about this. So Adam and Eve are in the garden, they're naked. They have no clothes. They enjoy in one another in, in, in all the ways. And there is absolutely nothing dirty, shameful, uh, dark, selfish. I mean, put your adjective. There's nothing associated with sex at this point. And what is the immediately, what do they do? What is the first thing they do? On. They hide, man. They put some leaves together. And so so immediately, what is attacked first before anything? What's attacked? Physical body. Yeah, it's a sexual deal, man. The enemy of their soul, Satan himself, that's where he attacked first. Because that undoes everything. You can get somebody in this area of their life, they can be the most solid, born-again believer in Jesus Christ and love the Lord and live a great life and serve God and do everything you can imagine as a Christian and be defeated in this one area. Man, serious stuff. If you think about it, Greg, God would have never had to say, don't adorn yourself with things because nudity was okay. That's right. They didn't have to have clothes on. They didn't have to have jewelry. They didn't have to have anything. That's right, yeah. Absolutely. And so, so uh, we know that, 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 that Satan is attacking this. Uh, and what we're going to find through this study is that this relationship is the absolute most important relationship in a marriage. I'm telling you, you might not believe it, but when we get through with this, you're going to see that the sexual relationship is the most important one in the marriage. So we see what biblical sex is. And we see that this uh, uh, this is what God intended. So what is unbiblical sex? I read that in italics. Any intimate contact, physical or emotional, with any person other than your spouse, that by definition causes physical, emotional, or spiritual. If you have sexual contact, whether it is physical or whether it is in your mind, you are damaging yourself first and foremost. And if you're having physical contact, 
with someone that you're not married to, you're damaging them in all of those areas. You might say, well, how can I be damaging somebody physically through a physical relation? I'm not talking about just hurting them with what you're doing. I'm talking about there are physiological changes in the brain documented that goes on whenever you do this. And, and, and a lot of those things don't, undone, uh, don't, don't get undone. Did you know that pornography changes the brain? I mean, they've done studies, man, brain scan. Pornography changes your brain. And that's permanent. And you, you think about what your kids are looking at on their, on their smartphones that you think that are locked and, and they can't get to. Porno, especially in young kids, mm -hmm. especially in prepubescent kids. It, it, it rewires their brain. And, and, and absent an absolute healing of Almighty God, it'll never get undone get undone so it is physical it is emotional it is spiritual the damage that is done through unbiblical sex we'll, we'll flesh that out a little a little later so who is the God of the unbiblical sex you're right Satan is Satan is the God of unbiblical sex and I Put that with a little G. Mm -hmm. Satan is the god of this world. Satan's the god of the air. Satan's the god of a lot of things. He is the god of unbiblical sex. Somebody read 1 Corinthians 7 5. Do not deprive one another except with constant, with consent for a time, that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again so that Satan does not tempt you. Because of your lack of self-control. Now we'll get to this again. This scripture later on, we're talking about uh, the, our, our sexual relation. But that is a command by Almighty God that you are to have sex and you're not to uh, cut off your spouse for any reason. Right there in the, on the Word of God. Right there. That's it. Right there. Do not. Do not deprive one another except by mutual consent. Now. We'll, we'll flesh that out, too, and what does mutual consent mean. But that's not what I'm focusing on right now. What I'm focusing on right now, look, why does he say this? Why, why does he command us as husbands and wives to have a sexual relationship that is robust and ongoing and frequent? What's it say? So Satan does not tempt you. you, you, you got to understand, Satan always is focused on sex. Always. That's where his primary victory lies is that he's focused on sex. You see what he did to those Adam and Eve in the garden whenever they were naked? He made sex something dirty. Right? And so what does the word of God say about the law? Uh, you know, when Paul's talking about the law, he said he didn't know what covetousness was until the law forbid it. And then what did he do? He started coveting. So here's how Satan works. He works with your flesh. And so the minute God says, don't do this, guess what happens? We're like, well, that must be fun. I, that must be something I'd like to do. How do, how do most people view God? They view God as preventing them from uh, uh, doing what they want to do. He's this rule maker. And yet God knows what we need. God knows what this kind of sex is going to do to us. But, but, but our flesh, working along with the enemy of our soul, it kicks in. It kicks in. And, uh, and, and you know, God, uh, Satan always counterfeits God. God has his way. We talked about this in the order of the family and all of that, and Satan perverts that. So God has an order in the bedroom, and Satan perverts that. And, he is, and he's a, the God of his way. And the vast majority of Christians don't understand that they are defeated in this area because Jesus is not in their bedroom with them. He is, and they don't know it. We'll talk about that. That's going to freak some of you guys out. <laughs> Fornication. Every sin list includes fornication as either first or last. I 
That's the Greek pornea. That that ring a bell. Mm-hmm. Pornography. Any sexual immorality. This is what Satan wants sex to be. He wants sex to be pornate. He wants sex to be fornication. Because it is an absolute slap in the face of Almighty God about what he created sex to be for and about. (laughs) And you would be surprised at how many Christians engage in fornication even after they're married. You say, well, how am I going to have? Because normally we think about fornication, and it is. Any sexual contact between anybody that is not married is fornication. Hands down. In your mind. In your mind. Guys, when you're going to the grocery store, or you're walking around town, or you're uh, wherever it may be, in your mind you commit fornication. If you allow yourself. Women too. Especially these days, man. There's just nearly as many of women hooked on porn as there is men. Perversion. Satan wants to pervert everything. He wants to twist. He wants to make things dirty. Lust. Lust is there. Uh, you know, uh, in, in 1 Timothy chapter 5, uh, whenever Paul is commanding Timothy how to deal with uh, women that are not married, he said, in all purity. In all purity. There ain't none of this flirting around. There ain't none of this, all of this kind of sexual tension stuff. You run from that stuff. It leads you down a bad, bad road. And so what we want to look at, and, 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 and we're going we're gonna to camp out right here for a little while, because this is going to lead us to answer that question that's at the top of this board, what is the great lie about sex? This Satan is perpetrated on mankind, but we're going to have to go to the Old Testament to figure that out. And so, who did God marry at Sinai? Anybody? Who did God marry? Did you know God was married? Nobody knew God was married? <laughs> Who's God married to? Israel. God is married to Israel. God has married Israel. And the wedding took place in Sinai. Somebody read their Exodus 24, verse 7. Then he took the book of the covenant and read in the hearing of the people. And they said, All that the Lord has said we will do, and be obedient. And Moses took the blood, sprinkled it on the people, and said, This is the blood of the covenant which the Lord has made with you according to all these words. This was the consummation of the, of the marriage between God and Israel. And it was what? It was a covenant of blood. Now, we don't make a big deal about this now because everybody in their, you know, the vast majority of people fornicate before they get married. But it was a big deal back then. And there had to be proof. There had to be proof of this pure covenant of marriage. And it was in? You all know where I'm talking about? First time a woman has sexual relations, there's a little bit of that involved. It's a covenant in blood. And so this was God marrying Israel. Now, God's marriage is not physical like ours. It's spiritual. But it tells us what our marriage is about. (laughs) We're getting close to figuring out what this lie is. It is is to tell us what our marriage is about. If you need more to back this up, if you're still not quite buying that God is married to Israel, somebody read Jeremiah 2 2. Go and cry in the hearing of Jerusalem, saying, Thus says the Lord, I remember you, the kindness of your youth, the love of your Bethrol, when you went after me in the wilderness, in a land not so. What does betrothal mean? Engagement, right? 
you, you, you're betrothed. It's, and, and, and let me tell you what, engagement back in these days was binding. You didn't get out of that deal. It was it was a covenant in and of itself. And so and so Israel is betrothed to God. They went to the Passover. They were baptized into the Red Sea. And so they are betrothed to Almighty God as they're wandering around before they get to Sinai. And he's saying right there, remember that, 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 that they, they went after me. You went after me in the wilderness. Whenever you fell in love with your spouse, did you go after them? And did you think about them all the time? You couldn't get them off your mind? I mean, it was like you lost your brain. You went after. This is what Israel did with God. They went after God. Somebody read Jeremiah here. This nails it down. I mean, this is not any clearer than that. Jeremiah 3, 14, what's it say? Return of back backsliding children, says the Lord, for I am married to you. I will take you, one from a city and two from a family, and I will bring you to Zion. Does it get any more clear than that? I am married to you. Israel. God's married to Israel. And so we need to look at that and we're going to say, okay, if God's married to Israel, and so we have a pattern for what marriage is supposed to be, and so let's look at what does that marriage look like? What does that marriage look like? <laughs> and so just like, okay, so what, when, what did Satan do when he attacked Adam and Eve after fall? What was the first thing he attacked? Sexual relationship, right? Look what he did to Israel. Look what he did to God's marriage to Israel. Satan, he, he, he has the same tactic, okay? Military guys. Any military guys in here? What is the absolute, and I'm not a military guy. What is the absolute first thing you have to do if you're going to defeat an enemy? Anybody? Any military guy? What do you got to do? What do you got to know? What do you got to know? You got to know the tactics of your enemy, right? I mean, I mean, if you don't know the tactics of your enemy, you're you're defeated right off the bat. You're defeated right off the bat. And I'm going to tell you, let, let me tell you, this book will tell you the tactics of the enemy of your soul. And you would be surprised how many Christians don't ever open this thing up. And they don't read it. They don't look at it. They live life defeated. And all the answers are right there. And so. So see, Satan did the same thing to Israel that he did to Adam and Eve. He attacked this intimate relationship. Somebody read Numbers 25. Now Israel remained in Acacia, how would you say that, grove. And the people began to commit har harlotry with the women of Moab. They invited the people to the sacrifices of their gods, and the people ate and bowed down to their gods. So Israel was joined to Baal and Peor, and the anger and the anger of the Lord was aroused against Israel. So what did they do? They began to prostitute themselves with other gods. They began to commit adultery on the Lord God. And that's it. And if when you see all throughout. The Old Testament, whenever God is talking about Israel, and, and, he, and he says they prostituted themselves with these other gods. And so they're committing adultery, attacking this intimate relationship that they have. Somebody read Judges 2.13. They forsook the Lord and served Baal and the Asherites. And so here's what Israel would do. And say, here's, here's what you need to know, you got guys and gals. For those that commit adultery in their marriage, uh, most of the, I mean, a lot of times they get caught and it leads to a divorce, or a lot of times, you know, uh, 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 you know, they'll, somebody will leave on their own or whatever. But the vast majority of adultery in marriages is you got somebody cheating on their spouse, whether it be physical or whether it be an emotional affair at work or whether it be online or whatever, and they continue in their marriage. So they got this deal going on the side. But I'm gonna tell you, you can't do that. You forsake your spouse, even if you're still married to them. If you're having any kind of sexual 
interaction or emotional interaction of an intimate in that manner with anybody other than their spouse. You forsake them. Because see, these people are still worshiping God at the temple. These Jews that are going after these other gods, they didn't abandon God uh, uh, physically. They were still going into the temple. They were still doing sacrifices, but they were worshiping these other gods on the side. <clears throat> if you read your Bible, uh, and you read uh, in the Old Testament, how many times do you say do you hear them say the high places? They went to the high places and ever under every spreading tree in Israel. You know what's going on there? Worshiping. Yeah, they're worshiping these gods. <clears throat> and uh, and do you know how they worship these gods? Anybody know how they worship these gods? They had orgies. Yep. They had sex. That's how they worship. They would go to the temple and they would have sex to worship this guy. So this is this is the gods that Israel were worshiping alongside Yahweh. And so under every spreading tree and every uh, pagan temple, you had shrine prostitutes, male and female, both. And so when you went to the church to worship, what you did is you had sex with a, with a shrine prostitute. And that's how they did. That's what they did. Uh, somebody read Jeremiah. There, there was something else they did. Jeremiah 2, 35. 32, 35. Somebody read that. And they built the high places to Baal, which are in the valley of the son of Hinnom, to cause their sons and their daughters to pass through the fire of Molech, which I did not command them, nor did it come into my mind that they should do this abomination to cause Judah to sin. There's two things involved in this worship of these gods. And what are they? And what else? Kill their babies. They kill their babies. That's what they did. Well, this is what Israel was doing. They were worshiping Yahweh at the temple and sacrificing and doing all their deal and coming and, 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 and uh, recognizing the Sabbath and doing the feast and all of that stuff. And yet here they're worshiping these other gods. And did you know every single one of those gods that Israel prostituted themselves with was the God of sex and fertility? Every one. They got different names. And we're going to talk about the different names in a minute. Well, they're right there. We'll look at it. It's on number six. Uh, Baal, Ashtoreth, Astarte, there are others, Molech. If you if you read these gods that Israel is prostituting themselves with, they're all the gods of sex and, and fertility. Who do you think the god of our country is today? Who is it? It's Molech, man. It's Molech. The sex god of the Canaanite. That's the God of the USA. Yeah. They got different names. They got different names, but they're the same God. What do we do in our country? Yeah. These people burn their babies. They didn't have the technology to cut them out of the womb and the woman not live. See, we kill our babies with abortion. We worship this sex God, Molech, by killing our babies in the womb. They worshiped him by burning them in a fire after they were born. It's the same deal, though. It's all about sexual license. It's about doing what you want to do with who you want to do it with to worship this sex god. And let me tell you what, the church is full of people worshiping the moment. Let me tell you what, if you're into pornography, let me just let me just tell you, if you're looking at pornography on your phone or your computer, this is who you worship. Right here. If you're having sex before you're married, I don't care if you love each other. I don't care if you're engaged. I don't care none of that. This is the God you're worshiping right here. And Christians don't understand that. And it breaks God's heart. Just like Israel. He had to watch that. He had to watch his wife having sex with these other gods. It's, it's an awful thing. Let's turn in our Bibles to Ezekiel. 23. Ezekiel 23. Is 
it's after Lamentations. After Isaiah, after Jeremiah. <laughs> Before Daniel. Page 1251. You're wrong, Paul. Okay. 1249. Well, I'll write, write my Bible. We've got to explain the Bible part. <laughs> I might want to assume everybody has the Old Testament all figured out. Okay. After, after Solomon, yet David was a king after Saul, and he was king of all Israel. Okay. And then his son Solomon, uh, came to the throne after him. Does anybody know what happened after Solomon died and his son became king? But, Separation of the kingdom? Yes. The, it, the Israel divided. Okay? Mm -hmm. So Israel that was, a, that was a result of David's sin. You remember David committed adultery with Bathsheba. I'm going to tell you, it's all about sex, man. This whole deal, you're going to, you're going to figure it out. It's all about sex. Uh, and then so the, the kingdom divided between what the Bible calls the northern tribes. And, and from, from that division forward, this is Israel. So after Solomon, whenever you see Israel in your Bible, it's talking about the northern, northern tribes. And then, and then the southern was Judah. Judah. And so, so, now you, so, so now God is dealing with Israel and Judah. Okay? I know it's a little confusing, but I'll, before we read this, I want you to understand that Israel, the northern tribes, prostituted themselves before Judah. Okay, they forsook God first. Whenever Jeroboam became the king of the northern tribes, he incorporated these sex gods of the Canaanites into their worship. Because he didn't want his people going down to Jerusalem to worship Yahweh because he figured that Hey, man, they're going to all change their loyalty and go down there to Judah. That's the background of this. So we, this is why we're talking about these two sisters. It's talking about Israel and Judah. And, and, and this shows how Satan attacks this marriage through sex. 23, verse 1. And the word of the Lord came to me again, saying, Son of man, there are two women, the daughters of one mother. They committed harlotry in Egypt. They committed harlotry in their youth. Their breasts were embraced. Their virgin bosom were pressed. Their names were Ohala and the, and the elder and Ohalaba, her sister. They were mine. And they, were, they bore sons and daughters. As for their names, Samaria and Jerusalem. I'm just going to use Samaria. Samaria played the harlot even though she was mine. And she lusted for her lovers, the neighboring Assyrians, who were clothed in purple and captains and rulers and all of them desirable young men and horsemen riding horses. Thus she committed her harlotry with them, all of them choice men of Syria, with all for whom she lusted, with all their idols she defiled herself. She has never given up her harlotry brought from Egypt. Who were they serving in Egypt? They were serving these sex gods by another name there in Egypt. And in her youth, they had lain with her, pressed her virgin bosom, morality upon her. Therefore, I delivered her into the hand of her lovers and into the hand of the Assyrians. So here's what happened. The, 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 God gave the northern tribes over to Assyria. They wiped them out and they assembly carried them all off. That's what he's talking about there. For whom she lusted, 
They uncovered her nakedness, took away her sons and daughters, and slew her with the sword. And she became a byword among the women, for they executed judgment on her. Now, although her sister, this would be Jerusalem, saw this, she became more corrupt in her lust mm -hmm. than she, and in her harlotry, became more corrupt than her sister's harlotry. So now we got Judah. They just watched the northern tribes mm -hmm. committing adultery and fornication with these sex gods, and God wiped them out with the Assyrians, and they're like, yeah, but we really like that. We like what they were doing. And she lusted for the neighboring Assyrians, the captains, the ruler, and clothed gorgeously, men riding horses, desirable young men. Then I saw she was defiled. Both took the same way. Both of them, they went the same way. And she increased her harlotry. She looked at men portrayed on the wall, images of the Chaldeans, portrayed in vermilion, girded with belts all around their waists with flowering turbans on their heads, and all of them looking like captains in the matter of the Babylonians of Chaldea in the land of the nativity. As soon as her eyes saw them, she lusted for them and her messengers. And then the Babylonians came to her into the bed of love and defiled her with their immorality. And she was defiled by them and alienated herself from them. And she reveled in her har harlotry and uncovered her nakedness. And then I alienated myself from her. Like my, uh, I, I alienated myself from her and I had as I had alienated myself from her sister. Yet she multiplied her harlotry. See, see she's, she's big time. I mean, she's, she's hooked on the pornography right now. She's hooked on the, uh, on the immoral sex right now. She's got herself in a real jam right now. She can't get away from it. She's lusting after it. She can't get more. That's what this sex does, man. Once you go down the road of unbiblical sex, and it gets hold of you, you got to have more and more and stranger and stranger to get what you're after. This is the way Satan works. This is what Israel's dealing with right here. Hooked on pornography and fornication and adultery, just like vast numbers of Christian people are today. It gets, it gets worse. 20. She lusted for her, their palmers, whose flesh was like the flesh of donkeys. Now, New King James cleaned that up a little bit. Their genitals like the genitals of donkeys, some of your other translations. Their issue, that's their semen, as of horses. And you call to remembrance the lewdness of your youth when the Egyptians pressed your bosom because of your youthful lusts. That's pretty pornographic right there in the Word of God, isn't it? Does it get any more rank than that right there? But that's what's going on, and that's what Satan does to marriages when you go down the road of unbiblical sex. It, it, it will wreck you out just like it wrecked Israel out. It undoes all of the intimacy. And it don't matter if your spouse knows what's going on or not. It's happening anyway. It's happening anyway. We talked about this number seven. What's the most common way these uh, cultures worship their gods? We talked about this. They had sex. Somebody read 1 Kings 14, 23. This is what's going on. They also built for themselves high places, sacred pillars, and wooden images on every high hill and under every green tree. And there were also perverted persons, shrine prostitutes in the land. They did according to all the abominations of the nations which the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. See, these perverted persons were these prostitutes that they would go and have sex with at, at their at, during their worship mm -hmm. time. And they were, again, both male and female. Somebody read Amos 2, 7. They pant after the dust of the earth, which is on the head of the poor, and pervert the way of the humble. A man and his father go into the same girl to defile, to defile my holy name. They lie down by every altar on clothes taken in pledge and drink the wine smuggled from Jander in the house of their God. So see, this is what's going on right here. So so you got, uh, it says a man and his father. So uh, a, a man and his son go up to the temple and they're going to have sex with the same prostitute. 
he goes up, they go up into the same girl, and they're lying down. This is somebody, like you said, orgies. That's what we're talking about here. They're getting drunk. They're, do, they're, do, they're doing uh, with wine and all of those things. This is what's going on. It is an absolute perversion of what God intended for the relationship to be. We answer this, who is the God of our culture today and what is the biggest lie he has got mankind to believe? We're going to answer this question right now. Do you want to, anybody want to guess what the lie is? As long as you love each other, it's okay. Yeah. You're a little satisfied. Yeah. The lie is this. This is the lie that Satan has got the vast majority of mankind. Sex is about physical pleasure. That's all it is. It's about physical pleasure. But let me tell you, here's the lie. Sex Sex is spiritual. That's the lie. But we're going we're to find out what does that mean. Sex is spiritual. It's not just physical. And you, here, here's the deal, guys. You cannot unhook the spiritual part of sex. Whether you're doing it biblically or whether you're doing it unbiblically. It is a spiritual act. You see, that's the lie. That's a lie Satan has portrayed, perpetrated on Christians. That is a lie super, uh, Satan has perpetrated on mankind. He has unhooked the physical from the spiritual. And if you don't have your mind wrapped around, I'm just telling you guys, if this is new and you don't have your mind wrapped around that sex is spiritual, you're defeated. You're defeated. And you don't understand the whole purpose of the relationship. And that's what we're here to do is look at the Word of God and see what is the purpose of the relationship. Number nine says, what lie people believe about marriage leads to more divorces than any. It's this right here. It's this right here. They, that they, they don't understand it is a spiritual relationship. Time out real quick. Yeah. I know he's calling numbers out and they don't line up with our handout. Oh, and that's because he's going off of two different ones. He changed. What number are we on? Eleven. Somebody read. We've read this a bunch. We'll probably read a bunch more before this is over. Somebody read Ephesians 5, 31, 32. For this reason, a man shall leave his father and mother and be joined to his wife. And the two shall become one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let each one of you in particular so love his own wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. You can't unseparate the physical from the spiritual. We represent God. We represent the Trinity, the Godhead. We talked about all of that. The whole uh, marriage, including the sexual relationship, is a picture of what's going on with God, with God and Israel and Jesus and the church. God, God's married to Israel. Who's Jesus going to be married to? Church. The church. Us. Yes. The bride of Christ. The people that have come to know him during this age of grace. Just look at, I mean, it's a whole other teaching. Just look at the types of Christ in the Bible. Abraham was a type of Christ. What kind of wife did he marry? Gentile. Isaac was a type of Christ. What time? What kind of wife did he marry? Gentile. Moses was a type of Christ. What, what kind of wife did he marry? Gentile. Joseph. What kind of, what kind of wife did Joseph marry? Gentile. Boaz. We did a study on the road. What kind of wife did types of Christ? See, Jesus is married to this church and so all of this stuff about marriage about sex it is all about God and his relationship to us and, and, and when you get your mind wrapped around this guys I'm just telling you 
sex is dirty no longer. And you can, you can steal back from Satan the taintedness of what he has and the guilt and the shame and all of that that comes along with that if we'll get our mind wrapped around this. And I know it's deep and I know it's, it's mind-blowing maybe to some, but I'm just telling you, that's what Satan wants it to be. He wants it to be hard and difficult so that you just say, forget it, it's too hard to understand, I'm not going to deal with it, and, and stay defeated. So why is a sexual relationship the most prominent attack? I bet we're out of time, aren't we? Uh, yeah. Well, we'll stop right there and pick that up right, right there. We've got a little bit left to do on, we're going to flesh out um, this spiritual side of the sexual relationship and, and then we'll get into the physical side. And so, uh, yeah, I know this is deep stuff, guys. I mean, I know that it is, and it, and, it's, and, and and just don't check out. Just just hang in there and don't check out and let it all come together. Because if you do, then you're going to have victory. You're going to have victory. Any questions on any of that? we got time to answer a question if you got one. One little question. Are you saying flesh out or flesh out? Flesh out. I'll, go, I'll go into detail. I'll go into more detail on, on the spiritual uh, aspects of that. Yeah, yeah. Any other questions? Y'all gonna close this out, bit? Lord, we come to you this morning, Lord. We're just so thankful, Lord. We have the opportunity, Lord, to be in here, Lord, in this classroom, Lord, in this study, Lord. I thank you for Greg, Lord. I know that, uh, Lord, this study, Lord, it's not the definitely not the easiest one to, to study for, Lord. Mm -hmm. Definitely not easiest one to teach. Lord, I pray that we would all look at your word, Lord, to see exactly the way that uh, you created man, Lord, you created woman, mm -hmm. Lord, to, to be united together, Lord, through you. Lord, we uh, as we read through this word, Lord, we can understand that none of your word returns void. Yes. Lord, I pray that we would pay attention, mm -hmm. Lord, that we would understand <clears throat> that it's what we're called to do, Lord, as a husband and wife. Lord, I pray that through this class, Lord, through this study, Lord, it would draw us closer to one another as husband and wife, Lord, mm -hmm. more importantly, closer to you, yes. Lord, as husband and wife. Lord, we love you this morning, Lord, we praise you, and it's in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.